So this talk is called, but, 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 what about grammar? And uh, running around the country, teaching English composition, working with teachers, homeschool parents, school teachers, and schools, and lots of people have opinions about grammar. And so I've been contemplating this for quite a while. So in this talk, uh, I will first address four paradoxes of grammar, then the three divisions of grammar, and I will finish up with the two best and two worst ways of teaching grammar, according to my experience and research. So a paradox is when you have two things that are seemingly contradictory. They need to be resolved because you kind of have this feeling, well, that's true, but this is also true, so how does that reconcile? So I found four, uh, I think, ideas that fit in this category of being a paradox needing to be reconciled. And the first one is this. Grammar is a very imperfect thing. It's a very imperfect science, but we treat it as though it is perfect. It's very much not like math, where there's always one right answer. In grammar, there can be many answers, and there can also be opinions about the rightness of various things. And so it's frustrating to us, and it's frustrating to children, because children really like to know what's right, what's wrong, black and white, yes or no, and, and so they don't necessarily do well with things like exceptions. Uh, spelling exceptions are particularly irksome to certain types of children because they learn a rule, and then as soon as they get that, they have to learn when that rule doesn't apply, and that just messes with their whole mind and attitude about spelling. We have some of that in grammar. The thing I would point out is that if you look at the actual terminology, we have what is called the liberal arts. Now, a lot of people think of that in terms of, oh yeah, that's that stuff like English and philosophy you study and you never get a job with. But if we go back before that and talk about the seven liberal arts of the classical world, there are the trivium and the quadrivium. The meeting of three ways and the meeting of four ways. And the trivium consists of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. The quadrivium consists of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. So the trivium are the qualitative or language-based arts, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium is the um, quantitative or mathematical based. And each one of these, of course, could be a whole lecture or many. But what I like to point out is that grammar itself is an art, not a science. It's something you do, not just something that you know. We get the word science from the Latin verb scio, meaning to know, right? I know. Uh, but you can't just know stuff and do it. Grammar is one of those things that you learn by doing. We don't really think of it that way, but when we put it in that context, it's helpful. So it's not a science. You can't know every answer with 100% certainty. There are always many ways to do something. And it's an art, meaning you could practice it your whole life. right? You, you actually could practice grammar for the rest of your life. It's that rich, that deep, that large. Now, most of us reach a point and say, that is enough. I have had enough about that. I will function in the world the way I need to function with that level of knowledge and experience and competency. Uh, but it is one of those kind of infinite things. So people will often say, well, how do I know I did enough grammar? And I will point out to them, how do you know when you've done enough piano or done enough dance, right? You can keep going as long as you want, but at a certain point, there may be other things that are a higher priority, and that's perfectly okay.
I came to this kind of harsh realization that this was an imperfect science in some steps along the way in my earlier time. Um, probably the first time it hit me was <clears throat> I had just started this idea of teaching writing seminars. So I came up with this business name, Institute for Excellence in Writing, and I made flyers. This was pre-internet days, so I had to actually print paper and beg people to put name tags, and I gave them the stamps and mail these flyers to homeschool group, and that's how I got people to learn about my seminar. And so I had made this flyer with my great you know, computer skills and all that, and I put this seminar would be good for dot, dot, dot. And then below it, I put dot, 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 homeschool parents, dot, 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 teachers, dot, 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 tutors, dot, 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 college students. And then I put dot, 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 anyone wanting to improve their own writing. OK, now this would not be a big deal in today's world because we have a completely different concept of what pronouns are. But in those days, 25 years, 27 years ago, uh, this affected me very strongly. Someone had circled on the paper any one and there and wrote a nasty little note that said, you can't get your pronoun to agree with your antecedent. You shouldn't be teaching English to anyone. Send it back to me anonymously. I believe from the handwriting it was probably an elderly man. But it hit me hard. I mean, I cried in my beer. I crawled under my bed. I crawled. I curled up in a ball, and I thought, <sighs> I'm so stupid. I can't get my pronoun to agree with my antecedent. I shouldn't be teaching writing to anyone. I should just give up now and just be a violin teacher forever. And, and then I thought, well, that's strange, because it doesn't bother me. This particular thing, any one, singular, and their writing, plural, it doesn't bother me. Why is it wrong? Why am I so stupid? It doesn't bother me. So I was talking to someone, and they said, well, check a usage book. So I don't know if you know this, but you can buy a big, thick book called English Usage. There's actually two popular versions. One is Merriam-Webster, and the other is Fowler's. Fowler's tends to be the more British one. But they're really interesting books, because what they contain is kind of the history of how words and expressions and things have been used over time. And so you can see when something first occurred um, and then how it was, where it was published here and there over the years. And what I discovered that this particular usage of any one singular and their plural was first published in the writings of Virginia Woolf back in 1920-something. And of course, she was a very outspoken feminist who rebelled against the idea of a default to the male pronoun, which would have been pretty much standard up until that point. Anyone who wants to improve his, and everybody's OK with the fact that this would apply to everyone because we don't have a pronoun that is singular and gender neutral. And so she was the one who first wrote anyone and there. And then I saw it had appeared in various magazines and newspapers all over you know, the 80 years past that. And I thought, OK, technically, I'm wrong. But precedent is on my side. Case law is on my side. I am not wrong. So I pulled my tears out of my beard, and I crawled out from under my bed. And I said, OK, I'm going to do this. And it was very useful for me to be aware that that person's concept of wrong was based on what we might call a constitution. But usage is the case law that is defined by whom? Who are the courts? Who gets to decide what's used and not used legitimately in English? Not authors. Editors, yes. They get to decide if this is going to go out this way or not. So there are many cases where we would discover that things have changed uh, from 
generation to generation, from country to country, uh, even sometimes from classroom to classroom within one building. I had a daughter go off to university and she called me one day and says, okay, daddy, I'm confused. Do you or do you not put a comma after the second thing in a list of three? I said, why do you ask? She said, well, I, I didn't put in a comma. And one professor then put in the comma and said, you should put a comma. But then I had an almost similar sentence. And another professor, I put in the comma, and they took it out. And I, I don't know what to do. I said, well, welcome <laughs> to the world of opinions about that. It's called the Oxford comma. And there is generally a consensus that you would use it, especially to help with purposes of clarity. But there are still people who hold to a particular belief about that, right? So I said, you, you, you don't try to do what's right. You try to figure out what the professor thinks is right and remember which one wants the comma and which one doesn't. And it goes way beyond that, too. I always say to kids, when you go to college, do not try to write well. Try to figure out what the teacher thinks is good and do that. And it may be different for one teacher than another. And by you know, adjusting yourself to different teachers, you'll actually expand your repertoire of what you are comfortable doing. And that's perfectly OK. And when you leave school and hit a more reality kind of situation, then you'll have bosses or editors. Or you'll decide for yourself if you like it or not. Uh, one more example. I sold for many years a book called Enough About Grammar by Joe Florin. It was written a long time ago, 40s, I think. It was written as a book to help business people use but not be burdened by their ideas about grammar. So what's enough? And uh, chapter two of this book is called Pay Your Money and Take Your Choice. And so it's very interesting because <clears throat> He had a very simple short sentence that any English speaking person might say. In fact, if you'd like to write this sentence down and contemplate it, you're welcome to. We went camping every summer. We went camping every summer. OK, you could say that. You could write it. And he had a question about this sentence. The question was, what part of speech is camping. All right, so now think how would you answer that question? If someone said, what part of speech in this sentence is camping? Well, that a direct object is not a part of speech. You've got to limit yourself to a noun. So you'd say it's a, a noun because it's receiving the action of the verb went. OK. Any other thoughts? Well, yeah, gerund would be that kind of, that'd be the noun. So he didn't know. So he went to six grammar experts. Now, this was way pre-internet days, so you couldn't Google anything. But they did have grammar hotlines. <laughs> I never knew. Might have been helpful when I was in school. Um, so he asked two college level English teachers who were considered the best grammarians in their department. He asked two high school English teachers who were considered the best grammarians and two grammar hotlines. And he got four different answers to that question. First answer was camping is a gerund. It's operating as a noun, receiving the action of went. So that was probably the one I would agree with. But then there were others. Another one was that um, go camping is a verb. And it can't be separated. So that's the attitude you would have probably if you studied a foreign language where you had you know, tenses, like imperfect tense or something. You'd say, OK, that's that. Go camping is a verb. Went camping is a tense of that. Another answer which I found very specious, but hey, it came from an expert. Camping is acting as an adverb, mm 
because it's telling how or when you went. <laughs> That's a stretch. The one I loved the most was camping isn't anything. <laughs> All right, so what to do when you have a grammar question? Four experts give you different answers. How do you reconcile that? And so his point in the chapter was you need to know enough, but you do not need to be able to answer every question you know, perfectly the way everyone would answer it because nobody does that. I think you know, in particular, this kind of world of sentence diagramming and kids is frustrating because you, know, you could spend five years studying sentence diagramming, and you know, in one minute, I could throw a sentence at you that basically defies being diagrammed the same way by multiple people. So there's that imperfectness. So we kind of have to just get over it and be OK with the fact that it's very fluid and changing generation to generation, sometimes classroom to classroom. So that's the first paradox. The second paradox is this. A knowledge of grammar is not a prerequisite for writing well. But you have to have good grammar to have good writing. So that's weird, <laughs> right? You don't have to know grammar to write well, but you have to use good grammar to have good writing. OK, so early on, I had this idea that I wanted to publish a book, but I did not want to write it myself. So I contacted someone who was a professional ghost writer. This guy, it's all he had done in his whole life. He had ghostwritten novels. He had ghostwritten uh, doctoral dissertations. He had been published all over the place. This guy was just a freelance professional writer. And I was kind of interviewing him to see if he could write this book that I thought I would like to sell. And in the course of the conversation, he said, I don't know any grammar. I said, you are a professional writer. And you, do, you said, said you don't know any grammar. He said, well, I don't need to. I thought, well, that's weird. Now, obviously, he knew something. But in his own self-perception, he didn't know a lot of grammar, but he didn't need to. So that's very weird. Why is that the case? Right? Well, it has to do with where we learn our grammar and how we learn it and what kind of grammar we're learning and what does it take to be able to write decently well or to write even eloquently. Uh, and we'll get to that when we talk about the divisions of grammar. But it does explain one thing, which is why the teaching of grammar has gradually been marginalized in schools in developed English-speaking countries for the last probably 40 years. Um, so you don't have to know how you do something in order to do it if you know how to do it. Does that make sense? Which brings us to this idea of relevancy, right? So when you try to when you try to teach grammar to an English-speaking child, and this is the third paradox, grammar is a very important thing. I would put it like capital V, capital I at the top of the list. It is an extremely important thing, and yet it is almost completely irrelevant to children. That's a paradox. So we think, oh no, it's really important. We have to teach it. And when you say to a 10-year-old child, I'm going to teach you how you use English, it's a little bit like saying, kids, sit down. I'd like to give you a little lecture here on how you ride a bike. The kid is saying, um, dad, I know how to ride a bike. Yes, you do. But you don't know how you do it. You need to study all of the biology and physics that makes bike riding possible. The child is kind of thinking, um, could I just go ride my bike? I mean, really, what's the point here? So when you attempt to teach English grammar to English-speaking people, 
you have a big problem with that being relevant to them. And that's going to be more true the younger they are. So there's a paradox. It's extremely important, and yet it is perhaps one of the most irrelevant to the child things that you would attempt to teach them. Well, now, let's unpack this a little bit. Why is it extremely important? Well, one of my favorite quotes is from Confucius, in this regard, is from Confucius, who lived just about the same time as Plato. And what's very interesting is you find that Confucius and Plato echoed each other in many respects about human nature and society and what's good politics and how to have a good life, right? Both pre-Christian philosophers. Confucius said this, if language is not correct, then what is said is not what is meant. If what is said is not what is meant, then what must be done remains undone. If this remains undone, morals and art will deteriorate. If justice goes astray, the people will stand about in helpless confusion. Hence, there must be no arbitrariness in what is said. This matters above everything. So that's a commentary on the need for precision in language and usage. And of course, I think we can see, especially kind of in our lives today, that imprecise use of language causes all sorts of confusion and frustrations. And I, one thing I find so fascinating about this quote is, is he, he said, <clears throat> if this remains undone, morals and art will deteriorate. If justice goes astray, the people will stand about in helpless confusion, thereby implying that morals and art going astray is the precursor to justice going astray. And what we see there is the intertwining of goodness and truth and beauty. And you can't undermine the one without undermining them all. And so uh, this, this statement by Confucius I find very interesting, particularly in today's world when we are essentially arguing about the meaning of words in a very basic and almost foolish way. Uh, and you know, how far astray is that taking us? But historically, there's a correlation between the rise in attentiveness to teaching grammar and the rise of civilization and politics and technology and everything, and the decline of the attentiveness of teaching grammar and the decline of civilization and politics and technology and, and everything. This is very well document, documented in a book which I highly recommend. Um, it is called The War Against Grammar. It's by David Mulroy, M-U-L-R-O-Y. It was written in 2003, and it's a really interesting book. I'm going to warn you in advance. This is a small book. It's small and it's thin. And it is not cheap. It is an expensive small book, which you're going to be irritated about having spent so much money on such a small book. But there are two reasons. Number one, it's written by a college professor. So, right? But the other thing is, you know, diamonds are small too. So sometimes good things. And I like it because it's a book that isn't longer than it has to be. Do you ever feel like you bought a book and Someone just added twice as much as needed to be there. Anyway, he didn't do that. So Mulroy was a professor of classics at the University of Wisconsin. And he noticed over the course of his decades of tenure there that the students coming to his class were increasingly unable to understand even the literal meaning of what they were reading and that this was a decline over the course of his time. And he wrote this, he took, a, I guess, a sabbatical or something, wrote this book in 2003. So he's reflecting on the last 
couple decades or so of students. And he wondered why their basic understanding was declining. And of course, these weren't, you know, English 101, 102 kids. These were students who had signed up to read classics, to read hard stuff and think about it, talk about it. So he tried a little experiment. He had a hypothesis that the reason was that they didn't understand grammar well. Therefore, they couldn't understand the meaning of what they were reading. So he tried a little experiment that he documents in this book. He took the first sentence of the Declaration of Independence, which is 72 words long. And he put that on a quiz and gave two bonus points. If you just tried to answer the question, you get the points. You don't even have to answer it right. You just have to give some answer. You get two bonus points. First question is, do you recognize this? And if so, where is it from? And then the second question was, in your own words, what does it mean? What he found is that fewer than half of the students recognized it at all. And fewer than a third of them had any idea at all what it meant. So he included some of the samples that he got from the answers to this question, which are in that category of being painfully humorous <laughs> or humorously painful. But just to refresh your memory, I will read the first sentence from the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So there you have it, Jefferson's original sentence. OK, so some of the students managed to get the gist of it. Here are a couple that he considered somewhat accurately paraphrasing that idea. When people decide to fight or separate among countries, cities, or themselves, they should say why they are fighting. <laughs> OK, that's a good one. Another one. In life, people dissolve political bands that connect them with another in order to join Earth and its powers by following nature's and God's path should declare why they separate. OK, that's fair enough. But some of the students seem to miss completely the idea. In people's lives, things may happen that would cause them to no longer want to be part of a certain government of which they are part. These things would give them reason enough to become their own ruling body. OK, well, there's some of it, but the whole point of the sentence is lost. And then, of course, some of them were really out there. When dealing with events in life, one should drop preconceived knowings and assume that everything that happens happens for a reason, and basically, life goes on. <laughs> I believe it is saying that as a group of people, everyone is equal, but when it comes to laws of nature, only the strong will survive. I love this one. Cut your earthly bonds and wear the mantle of nature and God. Wield the power and declare justly your ascension from man's law. Then all shall bow before your might. <laughs> then you, you see uh, kind of deeply the psychology that these kids are bringing to their world in college here. Every human encounter is special. And it is an important piece of an intertwined quilt. Every man and God's creatures should have the respect and dignity they deserve. Hard to disagree with, but that's not the point Jefferson was making at all. This one I love. I think it means that people should look at their own morals. They should follow the laws of nature and nature's God, but also in their own way follow their own morals. And then some were just honest. I can't paraphrase this sentence because I'm not sure what the point is being prevailed. Politics? Nature? And there's more. 
that's just a sampling. And so what Mulroy concluded was the reason people didn't understand the sentence is they didn't know what the subject of the sentence was. Well, the subject comes in the last clause of a whole succession of phrases and clauses. And so you have to kind of mentally be parsing that sentence. Well, where does that skill come from? So as a result of this, Mulroy investigated what has happened to the teaching of grammar. And that's where the title of the book came, that there has been an active war against the teaching of grammar in the United States beginning in the early 70s or so, led by no less than the, Council of, the National Council of Teachers of English, who have gradually come to a platform position that grammar is at best unnecessary. And now the position, of course, is grammar is racist. Because if somebody says something, you say that's right, and someone else says something differently, and you say that's wrong, then you're making a judgment about the rightness and wrongness, and that that is too often and too easily connected with you know, race and culture. Uh, so that's an interesting position. But he does go through and, and point out through history some very interesting things. For example, um, Henry VIII, not a, great, not a great hero of mine by any means, <laughs> um, but a very important and interesting historical figure he did one really significant thing as pertains to language. At the time of Henry VIII, the, the language of law was Latin. So everything important was written in Latin. And um, all over England, there were different teachers teaching different Latin grammars. And so someone would write something, and then someone else would read it, and they wouldn't agree on the meaning of it because they were all bringing a different grammar to the interpretation. And so Henry declared that every teacher in all of the kingdom must use the same grammar book, the same Latin grammar, Lily's grammar. And within one generation of that, there was an explosion of literature. It was the English literary renaissance. And you had Johnson and Shakespeare. But what, what was it was that now the grammar of the Latin Latinized the English and made it consistent so that everyone could build and expand on that. And so that's one example of how you see. Another example, of course, would be the, the origins of grammar and phonics were with the Greeks. Right? It was the Greeks who identified the whole concept of parts of speech. And then they took from the Phoenicians the idea of symbols that relate to sounds. And the Greeks really, for the first time in all of history, created a language that would accurately reflect an idea. And then that idea could persist over time and distance. Then the Romans conquered the Greeks and doing one of the most amazing things in history, rather than, than kicking out all the Greek stuff, they adopted the best of it and essentially conquered the world, not with their armies, but with their language, because no one else at that time had a language that could be very precisely recorded. And then you could send that message out and have a complete and accurate reproduction of language. Um, Hebrew, for example, you probably are aware, doesn't really have vowels in the sense that we do. So when you're looking at Hebrew, you're kind of figuring, well, that word must be what I think it is if there were these missing pieces. So it's, it's a great language to remind you of something you already knew, much the way you would maybe read a string of text with some missing characters. But you have an expectation what that is so you can read it. But if you didn't have the expectation, you might make different assumptions about the meaning of those things. So all of the glyph languages and the, the uh, um, you know, non-phonetic languages or the early phonetic languages, it wasn't until the Greeks and Romans put in the complete system that allowed for that explosion of culture that happened, sometimes referred to as the Greek miracle. <clears throat> 
I would go one more step forward and talk about the importance of grammar from kind of a, you know, a, a theological perspective. Um, you know, we, we say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing was made that was not made. And so this creation and this Word business, and of course in Greek, it's not word in the same way we would say it in Latin verbum, we would say logos, right? And what does that mean? Well, that would be the ordering principle of things. So now we have that in other words we use like biology, the ordering principles of life, geology, the ordering principles of earth, um, you know, theology, the ordering principles of studying God. So in a way you're looking at grammar as being the start of the ordering of the principles of all language with which everything else is possible. Nietzsche said a very interesting thing. He said, I am afraid we are not rid of God because we still have faith in grammar. I'm not exactly sure what he was thinking when he wrote that, but it is interesting to contemplate, is it not? That we have faith in grammar, meaning we believe there is a logic and an order to the universe. But if there is, it must have come from somewhere. There must have been a creator and a logician to create the logic and the structure. Otherwise, it's all random, which is you know, the effect of probably Darwinism and where we got to in terms of no longer having faith. But that idea of having faith in grammar, that's weird. <laughs> It's a, it's a weird idiom. All right, we need to move on, but uh, that's the third paradox. And I spent a little more time just because I think it's important to understand that when we are teaching grammar, we're doing something a lot more than just preparing kid for an SAT test or something very mundane and relatively meaningless. Okay, the fourth paradox, I get in a little bit of trouble. Some people uh, don't like it when I say this, but I really don't care anymore. Um, so I'm going to say it anyway, and this is my belief that analytical grammar is not a grammar stage type of activity. Now when I say grammar stage, i got to back up a little bit. Some of you who are familiar with the classical education world uh, came across uh, an idea that was first articulated in Dorothy Sayers' essay in 1947 called The Lost Tools of Learning. And in that essay, she roughly corresponded the three liberal arts of grammar, logic, and rhetoric with stages of development that children go through. And she observed and commented that young children have a high aptitude for memorization. They absorb raw information very easily. They, in fact, memorize more easily than they will ever do so later in life and that they have a particular aptness for just memorizing stuff and not necessarily even knowing what it means, but being able to, to say stuff, right? And so she called this in her vernacular, the Paul Parrot stage, like Polly the Parrot who can say things but not understand this idea. So, you know, she said, children can memorize a Latin paradigm, amo, amasamat, amamusamatas amant. They don't have to know all of what that means, but it's very easy for them to memorize and store that raw information. So she roughly corresponded the liberal art of grammar with this early stage of development, Paul Parrott. Then she said, as children get a little bit older, they move into a different stage uh, where they like to argue. She euphemistically called this the pert stage. I would call it the flat out obnoxious stage. It <laughs> usually starts up around 10 or 11, firmly entrenched by 12 or so. And they just, kids just wake up and they just look for someone and something to argue about. It's a natural part of their development. So Sayer's idea, well, that loosely corresponds with the liberal art of logic. And so they're tuned into logic. They're tuned into what makes good or bad arguments. And if they're going to do it anyway, you might as well teach them to do it well. So we should recover 
the teaching of logic in our schools. That's one of the tools of learning. And then she said they get a little bit older and they move into what she called the poetic. She had to keep her alliteration going there. So Paul Parrot, Pert, and poetic. And she loosely corresponded this with rhetoric, which is the artistic use of language to be persuasive. So basically, once you kind of learn what are all those things called, what are the rules that govern the behavior, now you're qualified to use those ideas to teach stuff or express thoughts and opinions, right? Okay. Now, this got a little bit, I think, uh, adopted wholesale um, by many people in the earlier days of classical education. Um, Doug Wilson wrote his book called Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning which was essentially uh, the story of his school, Logos School in Moscow, Idaho, and how they took Sayer's idea and incorporated that with classical content and created a classical Christian school. And so for many years, people were looking at that. And, and schools would even name themselves Blah Blah Classical School, and then they would call it the Grammar School, the Dialectic or Logic School, and the Rhetoric School. And they would divide their kids into ages. I think there's a few problems with this. One is um, you can't just say grammar's for little kids because anything you start to study, whether it's you know language or music or repairing a motorcycle, what's the first thing you have to do? You have to learn what are all those things called, right? You can't even begin to learn about something until you have the, the names of stuff, right? So grammar is actually the naming of things. And then you would get into the logic of it. Why are they attached in the way they are? And you would learn all the rules that govern their behavior. And then you would be qualified to attempt to diagnose a problem in a motorcycle and take apart and put back together the pieces so that it works again. That would be kind of real. So whatever you study, you always have to start with the grammar. You can't just pop in and say, let's just do rhetoric level stuff. But I would argue that analytical grammar, which is what are the rules that govern the behavior of all those things, is actually more of a logic stage activity. It corresponds more with that why is everything the way it is than it is in the earlier ages where the children are absorbing more readily. So, um, you know, I'm not opposed to these types of systems of teaching grammar that have very young children, six, seven, eight years old, memorizing a whole lot of stuff they don't understand. But I'm not sure it's the best use of time or the best approach. I think you do better teaching a more analytical type of grammar when children are moving into that age of being more able to deal with abstract concepts. Because when you think about it, parts of speech, this is a very abstract concept. So, you know, I generally will say yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about this until children are generally around 9, 10 years old. That's when it, it's going to start. And the danger of teaching anything when it's not yet developmentally appropriate is that you can cause a child to hate that thing, right? If you try to teach a child to read or write before they're old enough to do it, they will dislike it intensely. And that dislike can continue for years past when they get into the stage where it would be easier to do so. I think a lot of reason that people say, I hate grammar, is just because it was done at the wrong time in the wrong way. It is inherently beautiful and interesting, but you can mess that up. So that's the fourth paradox. I would argue that analytical grammar is not necessarily the best thing to do when you're deciding how to use your time with young children. I'm talking primary grades, right? OK, so those are the four paradoxes. All right, this will go a little faster now. We're into the divisions. Now, obviously, this is a construct of saying there's three different kinds of grammar. They're all integrated. But for analytical purposes, we can look at them individually, and that's helpful. So the first division of grammar I would call inherent, or you might say inherited. It's the grammar that you acquire from your environment, and it is most strongly established during the earliest time of your life, 
during that sensitive period for language acquisition and ease of memory, right? And so this is why everyone who speaks English believes that they speak correctly, right? Because however you learned it was what was correct for you when you were young, and it's sometimes harsh to realize that what you're saying is maybe not correct in someone else's view. Um, I will give you uh, an example I think almost all of you are familiar with, which is the problem of people saying, me and my sister are going to go to the concert. All right. Now, most of people my age and older kind of cringe because our parents were constantly correcting us. My sister and I, right? And so you get that. And, and then you start to practice that, and then you believe that is the absolute right way to always do something. And then when someone else does it the way you used to do it, and you know, you're like, ha-ha, that's wrong, and it's bad, and it's awful. Now, it's very common today to hear people in their 30s or 40s say, me and my friend, as the subject of a sentence. So somewhere along the line, parents gave up. Teachers <laughs> gave up. I don't know. Um, but the thing is, we don't really know why that is wrong. Um, the, then you get the funny other thing where people say, well, um, he gave it to my sister and I. Because you've been so programmed to always say, my sister and I, that you forgot that now you're using it differently. So you strip out the and sister business. Would you ever say, me will go to the concert? No. Why? Because it's nominative case, you have to use the nominative form, which is I. Nor would you say, he gave it to I. Right? You'd always say me. Why? Because it's in the accusative case. But in English, we don't really think of case that much. We just get corrections. Right? So our belief about grammar is formed by the environment that we live in. Now, the environment includes primarily people talking to each other. So we, as little kids, listen to people talk to each other, and that's how we decide how to talk. That's we just start imitating. And then we also have other sources of language. Now, unfortunately, listening to people talk to each other isn't providing the higher level of sophisticated language that empowers a higher level of writing and speaking. Um, historically, children were read to out loud in huge quantity because there was no electricity, so there's no other forms of entertainment. So the only thing you could do to entertain your children was read to them. And that's what people would do for, you know, every night for their whole life is they would just read to each other. And that was the main form of entertainment for a very, very long time, especially in our country that had a high literacy rate, right? The other thing is that people would memorize language. So uh, certain religious traditions would have memorized prayers or memorized scriptures. And then uh, poetry became a part of the curriculum. And so children, you know, 150 years ago, children were responsible for memorizing huge chunks of poetry and scripture and beautiful language, which was elevated in vocabulary and syntax and sophistication of meaning and nuance way above daily conversation. Uh, and then, of course, that would expand, and as children got a little bit older, they would be memorizing large chunks of uh, excerpts from famous speeches and things like that. And all that memorized language, all that constant exposure, and then the reading that they may do on their own, that would all form inherent grammar. And that would dictate the level of language you would use. Um, I always like to um, mention the example of Frederick Douglass. If you have not read a version of an autobiography of Frederick Douglass, you should do that. But it's a fascinating case study because he had zero education during the most important developmental period of life, separated from his parents, harsh, harsh, hard labor environment, illegal to teach an enslaved person to read. And yet he became, and that was for the first 12 years of his life, totally illiterate during the most important period. But then he became, I would argue, the greatest orator this country has ever produced. 
at least from his time forward. You can't find anyone who wrote speeches and delivered them as eloquently and powerfully as Frederick Douglass. So it kind of raises the question, how did that happen? Right? Zero education, greatest public speaker, influential influencer of his time. How did this happen? Well, he said, you know, as a free man, one of the first books I owned was a book called The Columbian Orator, which was published in 1795, I think, somewhere around there. And he basically said, I learned all the speeches. He memorized all the speeches so that he could furnish his mind with not just the vocabulary, not just the syntax, not just the sequencing of ideas, not just the beautiful use of language and literary devices, but the very seminal ideas of the most important things about what humans are and goodness and justice and truth from history. So we furnish the mind through environment, through memorization, and through um, the best of language that has been used before. This explains the, the second paradox. How is it that you could not know any grammar and still be extraordinarily eloquent because of your inherent grammar, which is by far the most important thing you can do on a daily basis? The second division of grammar would be applied grammar. And this is kind of the thing they would ask for on a standardized test like the SAT or the ACT. Uh, the test works and it has a little paragraph and it'll have a blank space and it'll be like one and then below will be a one and there'll be A, B, C, D, E, four choices or five choices of what is the best use of language to put in that blank space, right? And usually there's one that's clearly better than all the rest, but there have actually been court cases about SAT questions. Um, and so that idea of, you know, which is the best usage? You don't sit there and parse the sentence and say, because this is the you know, direct object and this is modifying. No, you just read it. And based on your inherent grammar, you know which is better. That's why kids who read a lot or are read to a lot score higher on the SAT language part than anyone else. And that having learned grammar may be helpful in rare cases, but it's not the gist of applied grammar. So. Applied grammar, you see something and you know if it's right or wrong, and if it's wrong, you can change it and make it right. You don't have to know how you do it. You just have to know what to do, right? Then you have the third one, which is analytical grammar, which is what are all those things called and what are the rules and intricacies that govern their behavior? And here we get into, if that's what you want to learn, <laughs> What's the best way to learn that? Now, we could have a conversation about how important that is and go back to the very first paradox, which is it's not a science, it's an art, and it's infinite, right? But we all kind of, as we would all like to have a certain musical literacy, a certain knowledge of how to dance or play a sport, we would all like to have a certain level of grammar literacy. So how do we get that? Well, the first two worst ways. Number one would be the out of context, which we often see in the worksheet workbook approach, right? So it's all just, okay, turn the page, here's a thing, practice identifying or labeling these things, okay, move to the next. Chapter 12, verbals, participles, infinitives, and gerunds. Who cares, right? I mean, right there, you just don't care. You turn the page, you still don't care. You've gone through the whole book. You still don't care. You do that for several years. You still don't care. And the fact that you don't care means you probably aren't remembering a whole lot of that, unless there's a super high level of repetition, which also can cause you to hate it even more. So usually that out of context, in isolation, simply identifying stuff is the second worst way. The worst worst way is to not worry about it at all and say, well, you'll just pick it up. Osmosis, right? Just put a grammar book under your pillow and it'll sink into your brain. That's all you really need. And that is kind of the approach that I think many of us experienced. Uh, maybe there was a teacher who really kind of hit it. But for the most part, it was kind of like, yeah, you'll learn grammar. It's just part of growing up. 
and then maybe it doesn't happen, and then you don't gain the benefits. So those are the two worst. Two best ways. Number two best way to learn grammar is in writing, in the context of using it. I have had people come to our teaching writing structure and style seminar where all we do is teach them dress ups and sentence openers in one day. And they will say things like, wow, I learned more grammar than I think I knew my whole life until today. Now, it's probably an exaggeration, but why did they have that experience? It was because instead of just saying that's what that is, I'm making them do that thing as part of a checklist in writing a paragraph. I guarantee you use the structure and style program and the kids master that dress up and openers checklist, maybe get into some of the decorations and things, they will learn way more grammar in doing that than they ever would from several years of blah, blah grammar workbooks. I've had kids come to my writing class who had three years of you name it grammar, still can't find the verb in their own sentence. Two days of working with the checklist, they now really get it. They get, OK, that's what a verb is. And then they check and say, is it a strong verb? Does it have a strong image or feeling? If not, where's my list of strong verbs? And pull the list off. But English is actually the worst language, or one of the worst languages to attempt to learn grammar, because it's a non-inflected language. And you think about just basic parts of speech. Think about a word like golf. Golf. It could be a noun. Golf is boring. It could be a verb. We golf every week. It could be an adjective. Get in the golf cart. We have words like all over the place in English. You can't tell what part of speech they are from just looking at it. You have to be able to parse the sentence and see how it's operating in the sentence, which makes English the hardest language to learn grammar. And it's even worse if you already speak English, <laughs> right? Which is why the number one best way to understand grammar is to study a foreign language. I meet adults all over the, every time I go anywhere and talk to anyone, they'll say things like, yeah, you know, come to think of it. I never really understood English grammar till I took German in college. That's when it made sense, right? Um, I met Japanese people when I lived in Japan who knew more English grammar than I did. Why? Because they didn't know it already, so they were having to learn it. They couldn't speak English at all, but they knew English grammar because they'd learned all those rules. So if you really want to kind of get x-ray vision into your own language, then the best thing to do is study a foreign language. And I would argue the best language to use is Latin. The reason being, 60-70% um, of all English words of three syllables or more are derived from Latin. So it's a boost to vocabulary. Secondly, it's a highly organized and inflected language. So when you see a word, you say, well, that has to be a verb, could not not be a verb. It has a verb ending. It's the only thing that could possibly be. So inflected languages with endings are easier to understand the parts of speech and the rules that govern their behavior. And then when you learn something in Latin, there's application because you don't already know it, right? You can read English and know what it means without any knowledge of grammar, but you can't read a Latin thing and know what it means without parsing the sentence and using your grammar information because you don't already know it. Does that make sense? Now, you could use other languages like Spanish or French or Chinese. It really doesn't matter. But Latin has certain advantages because it's closely connected with English in many ways. And it's inflected. And it's so organized. And when you go study Latin, you don't spend much time trying to talk Latin. I am sure that you have personal experience having spent maybe two or more years studying Spanish or French or something in high school or college. You can't have a three-sentence conversation with anybody to save your life. If you wanted to, you'd have to go live somewhere where they speak that language or marry someone who speaks that language and force yourself every day to do it.
But in Latin, you don't have to try to talk it or learn how to order coffee or anything. So you can just learn to treat it as kind of a pure study. You can learn to read it. You can learn to write it. And then the benefit is you kind of get x-ray vision into the nature of language and the nature of the structure of language and the, the ology of it, the deep logic, if you will. So that's what I would recommend, uh, is you use IEW's writing and fix it grammar program because it's all in context of being used right there, applied application and use, and then consider foreign language uh, probably when kids are around that age when you would study formal grammar, nine, 10 years old, and keep going and, and do more than two years, right? What can you really learn in two years? But you know, four or five, six years of Latin, what a foundation. And then if you want to go learn Japanese or, or Spanish or French, that's all going to be a whole lot easier because now you have a foundation in understanding the structure of language itself. So there we have it, the four paradoxes, the three divisions, the two worst and two best ways to teach grammar. So thank you all very, very much. God bless you. Mm -hmm.